Chapter thirty two of Agnes Sorrel by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty two. Let us abridge and improve French history. As it is generally written, it is quite susceptible of both abridgment and improvement. The power of the Duke of Burgundy was without bounds in the city of Paris, and his daring and his ferocity were as boundless. He remembered ancient offences as tenaciously as the Duke of Orléans had remembered kindnesses, and every one in Paris who had at any time shown enmity toward him either sought refuge in flight or stayed to receive abundant marks of his vindictive memory. But he had skill also, as well as daring, and especially that dark and politic skill which teaches the demagogue to turn the best and wisest deeds of an adversary to his disadvantage in the eyes of the people, and his own worst actions to the services of his own ambition. Oh, what a fool is the people, always the dupe of hypocrisy and lies, always deceived by promises and pretenses, always the lover and the support of those who at heart most despise and condemn it. That great many-headed fool followed the duke's path with acclamations wherever he appeared, although the evils under which they laboured, notwithstanding all his promises, were augmented rather than diminished by his sway. A hired sophist defended the assassination of the Duke of Orléans, in presence of the court and the university, and the people shouted loudly, though the excuse was too empty to deceive a child. The Duke declared that the maladministration of Orléans compelled the continuance of the taxes promised to be repealed, and the people shouted loudly still. The Prévost de Tignonville was punished and degraded for bringing two robbers to justice, though everyone knew the real offence was his proposal to search the houses of the princes for the assassins of the Duke of Orléans, and still the people shouted. Nevertheless, fortune was not altogether constant, and while the power of the Duke increased in the capital, let him do whatever he would, a cloud was gathering round him from which he found it necessary to fly. The Duchess of Orléans cried loudly for vengeance. The Dukes of Bourbon, Brittany, and Berry armed for her support and for the deliverance of the throne. The Queen, having the Dauphin with her, lent weight and countenance to the party, and gradually the forces of the Confederates increased so far that Paris was no longer a safe asylum for the object of their just indignation. It was then that the revolt took place in Liège, where the brother-in-law of the Duke held the anomalous position of Prince-Bishop, and Burgundy hurried away from Paris both to aid his relation and to avoid the advance of the Orléanist army, without risking honour and power upon an unequal battle. For a short space his position was perilous. The strong-headed and turbulent citizens of Liège, no soft and silky burghers as they are represented by the great novelist in an after reign, stout and hardy soldiers as ever were, dared the whole power of Burgundy. An enemy's army was in his rear, all the princes of the blood, the council, and most of the great vassals of France were against him, but he fought and won a battle, captured Liège, and turned upon his steps once more to overawe his enemies in France. Time enough had been given for disunion to spread among the allied princes. William, Count of Holland, interfered to gain over the Queen to the Burgundian party, and a hollow peace was brought about, known as the Peace of Chartres, which ended in the ascendancy of the Duke of Burgundy, and the temporary abasement of his enemies. Once more the vengeance of the Duke was visited on the heads of all distinguished persons, who had shown themselves even indifferent to his cause, but he forgot not his policy in his anger, and the spoils of his victims conciliated fresh partisans. Intrigue succeeded intrigue for several years, and in the midst of disasters and disappointments the spirit of Valentine, Duchess of Orléans, passed away from the earth on which she had known little but sorrow, still calling for justice upon the murderers of her husband. Her children, however, were powerless at the time, and it was not till the marriage of her eldest son with the daughter of the Count of Armagnac that the light of hope seemed to break upon them. 
then began that famous struggle between the parties known in history as the burgundians and the armanacs paris became its great object of strife and during the absence of the duke of burgundy it was surrounded if not actually blockaded by the troops of armagnac the orleanist party within the walls comprised many of the noblest and most enlightened men in france but the lower classes of the people were almost to a man burgundians and forming themselves into armed bands under the leading of john of troyes a surgeon and simon caboche the cutler they received the names of cabochian and exercised that atrocious ferocity which is the general characteristic of an ignorant multitude there was a reign of terror in paris in the fifteenth as well as in the eighteenth century and many had cause to know that the red scarfs of burgundy were dyed in blood anarchy and confusion still reigned within the walls nor probably was the state of the country much better but at length the duke of burgundy unable to oppose his enemies in the field unaided sought for and obtained the assistance of six thousand english archers and entered paris in triumph the offensive was soon after taken by the burgundians and the duke of berry was besieged in bourg but frenchmen were disinclined to fight against frenchmen and a treaty as hollow as any of the rest was concluded under the walls of that place even while the negotiations went on means were taken to open the eyes of the dauphin to the ambition of the burgundian prince and john sans peur saw himself opposed in the council by one who had long been subservient to his will but the duke found easy means to crush this resistance the people of paris were roused at his beck into tumult the bastille was besieged by the armed bands of caboche and his companions the palace of the dauphin invaded and he himself reduced to the state of a mere prisoner more bloodshed followed and burgundy at length found that an enraged multitude is not so easily calmed as excited his situation became somewhat difficult although the dauphin was shut up in the hotel st paul he found means of communicating with the princes of the blood royal without and nothing seemed left for the duke of burgundy but an extension of the convention of bourg to a general peace with all his opponents this was concluded at pontoise and against the will of the parisians the dauphin was set at liberty and the leaders of the armagnac party were permitted to enter paris burgundy soon found that he had made a mistake that his popularity with the people was shaken and his power over them gone he was even fearful for his person and well might he be so but his course was speedily determined and after having failed in an attempt to carry off the dauphin while on a party of pleasure at vincennes he retired in haste to flanders a complete change of scene took place the creatures of the duke of burgundy were driven from power and sanguinary retribution marked the ascendancy of, of the armagnac party the easiest labour of hercules probably was the destruction of the hydra for creatures with many heads are always weaker than those with one dissension spread among the armagnac faction the queen and the dauphin disagreed and the prince finding the tyranny of the armagnacs as hard to bear as that of the burgundians instigated the duke to return to paris john without fear however had not force sufficient to effect any great purpose and after an ineffectual attempt to besiege the capital he retired before a large army gathered from all parts of france with the king and all the princes of the blood at its head compiègne capitulated to the armagnacs soissons was taken by assault but arras held out and once more negotiations for peace commenced under its walls a treaty was concluded by the influence of the dauphin who was weary of being the shuttlecock between two factions and resolved to make himself master of the capital his first effort however was frustrated and he was compelled to fly to bourg with great adroitness he then took advantage of a proposed conference at corbeil between himself and the allied princes he agreed to the meeting but while they waited for him at corbeil 
he passed quietly on to paris made himself master of the capital and seized the treasures which his mother had accumulated in that city three parties now appeared in france that of the duke of burgundy that of the allied princes and that of the dauphin and in the meanwhile an acute enemy with some just pretensions to certain portions of france and unfounded claims to the crown itself was watching from the shores of england for a favourable moment to seize the long coveted possession from the time of the treaty of bretigny wars and truces had succeeded each other between the two countries hostilities and negotiations and during the late dissensions english alliance had been sought and found by both parties but at the same time long discussions had taken place between the courts of france and england with the pretended object of concluding a general and definitive treaty of peace henry demanded much however france would grant little offensive words were added to the rejection of captious proposals and suddenly the news spread over the country like lightning that henry v of england had landed in arms upon the coast of france End of chapter thirty two